What is going on, Warriors? Happy to have you on this episode where I'm going to chat a little bit about what's going on in my life and how you can learn from that. So we're sitting at two weeks since I had surgery, right? Still in recovery, still have one more week to go before I can actually get back to my normal lifestyle of working out. So what that means is that my workouts have changed and I want to talk to you about how my blood sugars have shifted both through a lack of exercise but also in surgery recovery and what you can learn about that, all right? So let's get into our theme song. I've spent the last 10 years pushing the limits while identifying trends and patterns in my type 1 diabetes management. Follow along as I learn, apply, and share the fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle strategies that I've learned from diabetes experts around the world. The real question is, how can we live fearlessly with diabetes while maintaining stable blood sugars? This podcast is here to give you the answer. My name is Matt Vandevecht, head coach and co-founder of FTF Warrior, and welcome to Part of My Pancreas. All right, so uh, a lot of you have been curious about what type of surgery I got. I actually have three scars in my lower abdomen now. Well, still healing scars. <laughs> you know what they call them at this point, because they're going to be scars at some point. Uh, hopefully not too bad, though. Uh, but came out of surgery, could not use my abdominal muscles at all. Now, they told me I can't lift anything over 15 pounds for three weeks. I'm two weeks out, and uh, I got to tell you, now I feel good enough to do it, but I know I'm not supposed to, so this is almost more difficult <laughs> when I can't lift things, but I think I can. You know what I mean? It's a lot of self-control. Uh, but initially, the first week was really tough. Turns out you use your core for just about everything. Uh, even getting out of bed in the morning, my wife had to literally push me up because I couldn't contract my stomach to sit up straight. It, it, it was a, a nightmare, to be honest. It was, I needed help for everything. But now I'm back on my own. Everything looks great. I'm walking every day as part of my recovery, feeling good. But initially, coming out of surgery, my, uh, my blood sugars did not respond the way I had hoped. And through surgery, they were great. They were spot on going in. As you probably saw, I saw a blood sugar of 100. I was hovering between 90 and 100 the whole night, the whole morning. And going into surgery itself, literally unicorn going in. If you don't know what a unicorn is, it's a blood sugar of 100. We celebrate that. Uh, but after the surgery, as they mentioned, I was talking to them, I was like, should I drink some apple juice? Like, I don't know if I want to go into a surgery at 100 blood sugar. I'd rather be at like 120, 130, you know, give me some buffer. And they were like, oh, don't worry about it. The stress of the surgery will cause your blood sugars to skyrocket. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll just take your word for that. <laughs> sure enough, after the surgery, I was at 200. It's like, wow, turns out getting stabbed by a surgeon three times, uh, it can cause some stress levels to go up. So blood sugar's 200, they came back down before I had my first meal because I was out of it. Went on the couch, took a little nap, and a couple hours later had my first meal, which, uh, you know, I was starving. I had to skip a meal going into it. So I uh, had my meal. Some stuff happened where I like kind of went into shock when I stood up because I didn't have enough high enough blood pressure and whatever else happened. Orthostatic hypotension. Uh, but blood sugars also responded in a bit of a messy way. So after that lunch that I had, blood sugars went from, I think I was like 120, was cruising after that correction that I gave, started at 120, had a, a relatively normal sized lunch. It wasn't too much, a little bit less food than I normally eat because I was worried I might feel nauseous, who knows. They shot up 250, I'm like, crap. There's actually a really, really funny video my wife took of me holding an ice pack on my stomach, walking laps around the kitchen, like clearly in discomfort because I'm not supposed to be that active on the first day, but my blood sugars would not cooperate. So, and I don't recommend that. I walked around the kitchen like in circles for an hour to try to get my blood sugars to come down. I do not recommend that. And I was kind of stuck at 250. Uh, I believe that the walk helped kind of stop the rise. But even with extra corrections, it took a while for those blood sugars to come down. Uh, but why did that happen, right? My, my basal rates are locked in. My bolus ratios are locked in. Correction factor locked in. What the heck happened, okay? Uh, I worked out the day before. Exercise, not a variable yet. I will get to that. Uh, the biggest variable that I can tell you is the stress, right? My body was recovering from a pretty intense surgery. And as a result, I believe that's part of the reason why I saw higher blood sugar. My body was just like, hey, cool, there's insulin, sure, but 
cortisol <laughs> and had my blood sugars going through the roof. And uh, it was frustrating. I prepared for that. I tried to adjust my bolus ratios as quickly as possible. So for dinner, I, I used what I call ghost carbs, which is essentially I tell my pump that I'm eating more than I actually am. So it gives me extra insulin. And I keep in mind how many of those carbs I didn't eat, right? So if I give myself, let's say, 10 extra quote unquote ghost carbs, then I watch my blood sugars for a couple hours, right? I'm like, okay, if I'm dropping, I know that I injected for 10 extra carbs that I didn't eat. But if I don't drop, which I didn't, cool. I gave extra insulin because my body was responding to that surgery. I was in recovery, right? So that's what my strategy was for the next couple of days. Thankfully, I was able to nail it pretty quickly. The next morning, uh, I, I ghost carbed it again and I ate everything super slow, kept a close eye on my CGM. And as a result, found out my insulin needs had doubled for mealtime. <laughs> I was like, what? I didn't eat half of my breakfast. And for me, breakfast is very large. Uh, all of my meals are very large. So that's a huge chunk of food. Um, I think for breakfast, I was going for, I don't even remember. It's probably somewhere close to 800 or 1,000 calories. But to have half of it not be eaten and blood sugars remain relatively stable. That's insane, because two days earlier, my ratios were completely different, right? So what I'm noticing is that within the 24 hours, I had uh, a bit of an increased need for insulin, specifically bolus, but it seems also basal. Because of my increased stress level, my body is recovering, it went through a pretty intense experience. So in, as a result, I saw a need for insulin that I didn't have before, but then as the days went on, my recovery obviously starts to get better. I feel better. I'm less sore, but I still can't exercise. So I'm like, all right, how's this going to work out? This is the longest I have not exercised in a very long time. I try to remain active on a daily basis. And so the fact that all I'm allowed to do is walk kind of throws a wrench in my plans. And I already accepted I'm going to lose some weight, right? I'm going to lose some muscle mass that I've worked very hard to achieve. And that was frustrating, but it's just part of the deal, part of surgery. And uh, going through my days, I kept giving those ghost carbs, kind of keeping a close eye on my CGM, my constant glucose monitor, seeing what my blood sugars did with extra insulin and how much I can adjust back and forth. And uh, what I found for me is that for breakfast, actually, let me think about this. Yeah, for breakfast for the first week, I needed about 30 ghost carbs, quote unquote, uh, after that first day. So the first day, I needed like 50 or 60, quote unquote, ghost carbs. It was nuts. Uh, and that's essentially, I told my pump, I'm eating 60 more grams of carbs that I didn't eat because I needed extra insulin. Uh, and this is, I don't recommend this. Okay. <laughs> this is kind of my renegade way kicking in, right? Uh, going against the grain. But for the rest of the days, I noticed as my recovery improved, I needed uh, a little bit less of that ghost carb strategy that I used to the point where now, and currently I take about 20 extra quote unquote, ghost carbs per meal. And that keeps me level. I've been in the nineties and low one hundreds all day. And so I found my new bolus ratios, but here's the thing that kept consistent because I'm consistently not exercising, right? What happens as I reintroduce exercise? What happened as a result of me not exercising? My body is recovering now. I feel great. I'm not sore anymore. So why do I still see an increased need for insulin? Well, it's because I'm not weight training. I'm not lifting weights. I'm not doing exercises on a daily basis that I would usually do hit high intensity exercises, right? And so when you do those exercises, you hold on to insulin sensitivity for a couple of days, typically. Now, when you go for a walk, that's maybe a day. We go for a run, same thing day, maybe two days that you see increased insulin sensitivity. When you weight lift, when you incorporate the muscle groups, rah, that's when you can see increased insulin sensitivity for longer periods of time, up to three days. And that's pretty cool, right? That's where you can get less insulin, the same result of eating the same foods. So as I had to stop weightlifting, right? Remember, remember I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't eat. I couldn't lift anything over 15 pounds. As a result, my muscles are no longer being used, which means they're not being in recovery mode. And what happens, one of the reasons why we see increased insulin sensitivity with weightlifting specifically is that as you use your muscles, there's stored glucose in your muscles, known as glycogen. That gets released and used as that instant energy because contractions, oh, they happen right away, right? So when that's not happening, I'll, I'll, I'll revisit that, sorry. When that is happening, 
we are using the stored glucose and in recovery after the workout our muscles want to pull in the glucose from your meals right they want to pull in that gluco glucose to repair your muscle tissue, get you ready for the next workout. So as a result, they're pulling glucose from the bloodstream. You need less insulin to transport that glucose. Interesting, right? So when I stopped working out, my muscles are no longer hungry for that extra glucose pulling it from the bloodstream. As a result, I need to take extra insulin to transport the same amount of glucose into the muscle, into the liver, into the adipose tissue. Does that make sense? So what we're looking at is I have three weeks off where I cannot lift weights. As a result, I require extra insulin. Now, if you're unaware of these concepts and you make a big shift in your life, whether it's to stop working out or to start working out, you're going to have a bad time because <laughs> it's going to seem like your whole world just got flipped upside down, right? All of a sudden you need completely different amounts of insulin. What is going on? And you might not remember, oh, it's because... I haven't exercised in a week or maybe it's because I just started exercising and all of a sudden I need crazy less insulin I'm going low all the time and we overlook these items sometimes these items I'm having a hard time talking right now we overlook these items in our life is there a difference in exercise intensity duration uh, consistency over time if there is a big difference you are likely to see a difference in your insulin needs right so for me I need to double the insulin on day one Day two, still almost double the insulin. As time went forward, it started to slow down and get closer to my norm, but I still do require more insulin, specifically around mealtime, my boluses, because as I introduce food into my system, the muscles are no longer pulling that glucose out, right? So as a result, I need more glucose, I'm sorry, more insulin to transport the glucose. Now for my basal, not a big shift. That one's already pretty locked in and I'm still going on daily walks. So my body is still moving, right? I'm still circulating everything. And as a result, my basal stayed relatively the same. But my bolus, because my muscles are not involved at all, like you'd be surprised how many things are over 15 pounds. It's embarrassing. <laughs> I have to like, I have to ask my wife to do a lot of work for me. I'm like, hey, can you pick up the, the box of my diabetes supplies that was delivered? Cause it's 21 pounds. Uh, I feel useless. <laughs> it's weird. But either way, I just want to point this out because I'm not using my muscles anymore. They're not pulling glucose from the bloodstream and helping lower my blood sugar. So as a result, I have to give more insulin to cover the same food. Okay. Now what happens next week? I got one week left when I can start lifting again. Ooh. Got to keep that in mind, right? Got to remember that as I reintroduce exercise, my muscles are going to start pulling that glucose from the bloodstream, therefore lowering my blood sugars and assisting the insulin. What does that mean? It means I better be aware of the insulin changes in my bolus, right? Otherwise, I'm going to have too much insulin on board. I'm going to go low. I'm going to have a bad time. So as you increase exercise, as you decrease exercise, especially if it's a rapid shift, if you're going from I haven't worked out in a year and I'm going to go work out for a week straight or like me, I've been working out for years, five, six days a week and now nothing <laughs> for three weeks straight. If you have a massive shift, you are likely to see a massive shift in your insulin needs as well. So be aware of that. Okay. So what I want you to pull away from this episode is as you introduce big shifts in your life, this could be exercise, this could also be diet, this could be total sleep, it could be hydration, it could be stress. Big shifts in life most definitely can affect your insulin needs, okay? The more consistent you can keep these things, in other words, if you're not recovering from surgery like I am, uh, if you can keep exercise relatively consistent every two or three days, go for a workout, right? Or if you're walking like I am right now, Go for a walk every day. Keep it consistent. The more consistent you are with your exercise routines, I guarantee you the more consistent your blood sugars will respond with your basal, your bolus, your correction. Everything is going to play a heck of a lot nicer if you can keep your exercise routines consistent. And uh, being consistently lazy does not count. If you're going to consistently be a couch potato, <laughs> blood sugars are not going to respond the same way because the muscles aren't helping out, right? They're not pulling glucose from the bloodstream. You want to incorporate exercise. I know it's a little bit scary for some people. A lot of us, including myself, have had scary experiences where you go to the gym and you drop way too fast, way too far, right? That's not fun. 
that can cause some, some trauma. That can cause some anxiety in the future surrounding low blood sugars. And as a result, we don't want to go to the gym anymore because all of a sudden now that's a scary place. But what you have to understand is if you go to these, these places, the gym, go for a run, go for a hike, with this knowledge in mind that I might require less insulin because I'm incorporating exercise, all of a sudden the whole world becomes a lot less scary, becomes more predictable. And as you consistently incorporate that into your life, blood sugars start to play nice. So if you want to understand more about exercise specifically, this is, I obsess over this stuff. It's, it's super fun for me to dive deep and analyze what's really going on. How do I predict my blood sugars through different types of exercise? Because different types of exercises will yield different results, both in your body, but also in your blood sugars. If you want to dive deeper into that, I did a free training that I want you to go check out at diabetesinaction.com. Okay. So in that training, I go into how I can predict blood sugars through different exercises. I go into how I knew how much different insulin to give, how to adjust on the fly, how within 24 hours of a whole new lifestyle, right, recovery, no exercise, uh, not being able to lift 15 pounds, within 24 hours, I was back on track, blood sugars cooperated back into my 95% whatever time and range. I can do that because I use something called the 80-20 blood sugar formula, okay? Now there's a free training where I describe exactly what that is and, and I give you bits and pieces of how to create it, how I discovered it on my own, and how to incorporate exercise into that formula. And I want you to check it out right now at diabetesinaction.com. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I wanna thank you so much for watching, for listening. I really do appreciate you guys having, or you guys coming here to learn from me, to listen to my stories. And uh, I appreciate having you in the community as well. So I wish you the stablest of blood sugars. Remember to head over to diabetesinaction.com, grab that free training. And uh, as always, keep up the fight.